First, the first thing I'd like to say today is I'm not here to scaremonger. Uh, I'm not here to sensationalise. Um, I just want to put before you what I think is um, about to happen, I believe. Yeah. Um, the facts that we get from Scripture and the situation that we find ourselves in, in, the, in uh, what's going on, uh, regarding what I would call a financial meltdown, uh, which I believe is coming very soon. Now, I don't want to alarm anybody in terms of that, but if you're hanging on to thousands of pounds in the bank, uh, I wouldn't tell you to get rid of them, but just don't allow yourself to hang on to it too tightly, shall we say. Uh, we are told, of course, to give everything to the Lord and um, you know, follow him, so that's what we really need to be doing at this time, I think. In order to, uh, to sort of look at this subject, we, we need to look at a number of things this morning. What does the Bible say about a financial collapse, if anything? How has the situation come about? How have we got into the state that we're in? What would make this collapse any different from, say, the 1930s, when we had the big collapse and depression? And what is the great deception that's going on here? Because there is indeed uh, a deception going on. Things are not what you think they are. The one thing I would also say at the very beginning is, although things are not what we would believe them to be, the one thing that I do know for certain is that God is in control. Amen. And we cannot get away from that, nor that we, would we want to, uh, and we need to trust him for the future. Satan has been given this earthly realm to, if you like, do what he wants with, until his time comes to an end. And he is having a, a right old time at the moment, trying to get men and, God, uh, men and women away from God so that they lose uh, their salvation or their souls or whatever it is, that they don't go towards him. But God is on the throne. Amen. He is almighty and all things are under his control. So the first question we need to look at then is what does the Bible say about the financial collapse, if anything. And I wonder if you would turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation. Can we have the lights on, please, so we can see? You can have the lights on, if they work. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to read uh, just a, a couple of verses from Revelation chapter 6. And uh, verses 5 to 8, if we can, to start with. And uh, they say this. When he open, opened the third seal, yeah. I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked and behold a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given, was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And then if you would turn, please, with me to chapter 13 of Revelation. And... Uh, I want to read from verse 11 to the end. Again, I'm sure that it's scripture that you already know. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that even fire comes down from heaven, or he makes fire come down from heaven uh, in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs, which he has granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give, the beast, uh, to give breath to the image of the beast, 
that the image of the beast should both speak and <coughs> cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now those uh, two passages come at sort of different times, if you like, obviously in Scripture, uh, within the judgments of God. But to simplify matters, because some of us may have different um, <coughs> thoughts about when the rapture will occur, um, my own belief is that the rapture will come just prior to the first passage we read. But I can't be totally sure of that, and I wouldn't be so bold as to say definite that that was the the way it will be, because there are others that could argue from Scripture that we would go mid-tribulation, there are those that would argue at the end. I would not fall out with anyone on any of their positions. I don't think it's a, a subject that's worthwhile falling out on. <laughs> but um, anyway, Revelation chapter 6 certainly says uh, that a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see that they don't hurt the oil and the wine. And that seems to indicate to me that there is going to be some sort of financial crisis that involves food becoming scarce or too expensive. And um, perhaps that will be because of war. Uh, perhaps that will be the collapse of world economies and it will cause inflation to, to go to astro astronomical levels. Uh, as they did back in the 30s. And I, I wonder if you can remember, there was a, or well, there is a sort of famous photograph of a man with a wheelbarrow full of cash back in the 30s. Do you remember? It's one of those ones that seems to get, you could excuse the pun, wheeled out at times when you look at it. But, uh, you know, in a sense, that's the sort of thing that it's describing, isn't it? That the man that has got this barrow full of money will actually only just about be able to afford a loaf of bread. It's going to, sort of erupt. And then later on in chapter 13 we read that man will be forced to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark on the, of the na or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now the things I'm going to go through you can find on the internet no problem at all and I'm going to go through a number of things that I've, I've got from there which I hope will sort of open your mind a little bit to where we are within the prophetic calendar. Okay, and the first thing I want to show you is this. Two comments. One by a man called Brock Chisholm, who was the director of the UN World Health Organization. He said, to achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their individualism, their loyalty to family traditions, national patriotism, and religious dogmas. Is that not what is happening today? Yeah. Yeah. Secondly, David Spangler, the director of the, the Planetary Initiative uh, for the United Nations, says no one will enter the new world order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship Lucifer. No one will enter the new age unless he will take a Luciferian initiation. Basically, a Luciferian initiation is something a little bit like uh, what happens when you join a Masonic Lodge, mm -hmm. and uh, it is totally uh, satanic. Uh, but it's interesting to see that people are now being quite outspoken uh, on these subjects. They are no longer, as they did, hiding themselves, uh, like the Bilderbergers and that certainly used to do. So it certainly seems to me that even in the minds of men, this system... Uh, or mark, or whatever it is, is certainly within man's mind right now. And uh, as we'll see later on when I, when I talk, uh, for those of you who still remain, <laughs> um, you know, I'll show you a little bit more about that as, and, and where we are. But that's quite interesting. So how has the situation come about that I can turn around and say to you, there is going to be a coming econ economic crash. How have we got to this situation? Because if you listen to the news, and if you listen to David Cameron and people like that, they'll say, 
Well, we put measures in place. We are wiping out our debt. And we'll be okay. That simply is not true. That simply is not true. We would certainly associate what is happening now with the, the near arrival of what the Bible classes as the Antichrist. We could start by saying, of course, that, well, all governments are at fault and have got us to this position. And, um, you know, we look at our own government here, don't we, and we look at the Labour Party and we look at the, um, the coalition. One will blame the other and the other will come back and, and blame. So now we have Labour telling us that, well, it's the coalition government that's got us into this position, having forgot that Labour started it off. And, uh, you know, they, they, we get this to in and fro in of who's to blame? Well, of course, they're all to blame, really, aren't they? The situation in 2010 was uh, a bit like this. The coalition took over with what they said was a 700 billion national debt. Do you know, I can't imagine 700 billion. I have a char trouble actually trying to think about 700, let alone 700 billion. <laughs> but what they did was they brought in austerity measures and they cut things to the bone. They stopped people having wage rises. Basically, it was a method of control uh, in order to so-called pay off this 700 billion. So obviously taxes were, were hiked up in certain places and there were lots of cuts. And I'm sure by now you have all come across these cuts in one way or another. They have affected you in one way or another. For me as a police officer last year when they came in, I saw uh, the police numbers cut amazingly. Yeah. In my own uh, county of Bedfordshire, where we had six police stations, it was cut to two. And so there were areas in Bedfordshire that no longer got a policing present, mm. presence. You can imagine what happened. <laughs> yeah? They tell you that crime is going down. And the reason crime is going down is because actually we're not recording it. Mm. Because we're not there finding it. I used to go around the little local spots finding people with drugs and all sorts. Well, if you're not there to find it, you don't know it's going on. Yeah. Therefore, it's no longer being reported. And so that's the sort of financial state we see ourselves in. Now, the government's now been in power for a number of years. So we should be seeing that debt having a serious hole in it because they've been ploughing money into it left, right and centre. At least that's what you'd expect. <coughs> Tony Blair had a deficit of 150 billion when he was there. His mate next to him raised it up to 250 billion. But look what David Cameron's done: 700 billion. Now that's not 700 billion that he inherited. That is a further 700 billion in debt that he expects to be by 2015. So where has the austerity savings gone? I'll tell you where it's gone. It's gone on things that perhaps we don't know about, uh, and it's gone on measures that really we should not be financing. It's going to other countries that perhaps should do a little bit more. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against giving our money away, don't get me wrong. But it does ask the question, well, what's happened to all the money that we've saved? Our debts are now 900% of our economy. In other words, what our economy sort of raises, what we earn and everything, our debts are 900% uh, now above that. You can get all this, you know, you don't have to believe me, but you, you'll find this quite, quite readily. And part of the problem is the banks. The government and the banks together have created a situation of boom and bust. Um, and they've put measures in place which actually don't hurt anybody but us. So we can't blame David Cameron and all his, his cabinet for all of it. The banks have played their part. In fact, David Cameron is really just a, a puppet mm -hmm. on the world scene. Yeah. Yeah. We all are. Yeah, exactly. 
I was interested to hear the other day, because now we're getting these broadcasts on behalf of different parties for the European elections. And I was interested to hear the Green Party's European election uh, broadcast. And the presenter there said that they were the only party standing up against the secret trade deals by the USA to control trade. And I thought, where did that come from? I thought we were involved with Europe. But there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. So where are we going to go now? Because basically, we're getting money being printed, because we need money, and so they, they do this quantitative ease and stuff, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. And uh, then, of course, we get the interest rate rises and down. And Where do we go from here? Who is behind all of these things? Well, I'm sure that you are aware of many of the so-called secret societies. But let me just give you a few. Now, this is not the biggest, biggest list, but I just wanted you to see how they cover everything, really. Under the banner of Illuminati, all right, which really covers the whole lot. They are the guys that ultimately are in charge. You will find that the majority of US presidents are part of the Illuminati. You will find that Prince Charles is part of the Illuminati, yes. if you look into it. There's all sorts of things that are there. But they have different groups, as you can see. They control, within the banking and money group, and I've only put down the things that you might um, actually recognise here, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. They control the World Bank, and they control the International Bank of Settlements. They're the ones that tell you what your um, rating is as a country, what your debt is worth, and now they can sort of get rid of it for you or not, as the case may be. So they're, they're three major banking departments, if you want to call it that. On the other side, you've got those famous secret societies, Freemasonry. You'll be probably surprised just how far-reaching uh, Freemasonry is. You've got the Skull and Bones, you've got the Knights Templar. And the Knights Templar, which was disbanded, uh, is actually one of the things that's being re... What's this name? re generalized or whatever, by the new Pope. Uh, so we might see them come a little bit more to the fore. But then you've got the political group, the government leaders that meet, the G8 and G7 and G this and G that, you know. The Bilderbergers, the UN, the Trilateral Commission, and the Club of Rome. And within the Club of Rome, I'm going to talk about another thing called um, oh, it's, it's, uh, Agenda 21. Uh, but they are the people that are, if you like, herding us to be where they want us to be. You've got the different intelligence groups. They are all under the control of the Illuminati. The religious groups, the wonderful World Council of Churches, I do say that with, um, you know, um, <laughs> the World Parliament of Religions. And then there's all these New Age cults and so on. The, the problem we have at the moment, and uh, again, I'll talk about that a little bit later on perhaps, but the church is being deceived. The church is getting involved with these things, not knowing where they're going. I had uh, a lady in my church uh, the, other, the other week said to me, she was invited by a Muslim lady for a cup of tea. Okay, fair enough. And she come away from that little cup of tea saying, do you know... The Muslims are the same as us, really, aren't they? <laughs> you know, they, their Quran says a lot of things that's very similar to the Bible, so it can't be all that bad. And I'm thinking straight away, you've, you've been had. Yeah. You know? Uh, and that's nothing against her. She's a lovely lady, but, you know, it's very easy for us, if we're not on the ball, to be deceived. And so we need to sort of, you know, be, be on air guard. Anyway, behind all of these, I'm sure you've heard of people like the Rothschilds. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the Rothschilds, in a sense, are one of the monopolies behind it, all that this is going on. And they really, back in the... Oh, going right back, have made all their money through war. And they were quite astute with that, because what they did was they created the war in the first place by people in the, in the right places. But then they financed the war both sides. Now, imagine the situation... If Britain were to go to war with France, let's just pick the two nations out of the air, 
Now you know that Britain hasn't got the money to fight a war, so the Rothschilds will come along and go, well, we'll lend you the money so that you can buy your bombs, your bullets and all the rest of it. But they also go to France and say, you haven't got the money, so we'll lend you this money. Now in return, once the war's over, you need to pay back this debt. And in order to pay back the debt, they are taking over things like the water companies, the gas companies and the electric companies, the things that we as a country need. But it's now in the hands of men outside of our country. And that's what they've done around the world. Around the world. And they are the ones who have created these central banks, these federal reserves of the USA. Did you know that the Federal Reserve is not the government? Yeah. Yeah. It's a private bank. And yet they rely so heavily on it. The World Bank as well has got into these things. And so the Rockefellers are there in the background, they're doing all their things, they've created a thing called the Trilateral Commission, which is a policy-making forum that is dedicated to fostering closer cooperation between North America, Europe and Japan. That's why it's called Trilateral. Okay? They're trying to bring these big economies together. Then, of course, we have people like the Bilderbergers, now, this is a group of 120 or so top Americans and European, what we would call movers and shakers. The ones who decide secretly what the policy across the world is going to be. Well, of course, they did meet up very secretly up until probably a couple of years ago. And then you remember they met down in Hertfordshire and it was all over the newspapers. <laughs> the reason for that is that They've gone so far now that no one can stop them. They don't need to be secret anymore. What are you going to do about it? Nothing, because we can't. They control things. And the Bilderbergers is quite a group. A lot of people will say, well, that's old hat now, but it's not. Do it, look for yourself. They also have another group which is linked to them called the Club of Rome. Rick Warren was, I don't know where he still is, a member of the Club of Rome. <laughs> And all, yes, we all know about Rick Warren, the, uh, well, the leading pastor of the United States, the man that has an ear with President Obama, who has now come out with Chris Lamb. Yeah. Mm. And we'll talk about that later too. But this Club of Rome was put together back in 68 with the uh, Morgenthau Group for the purpose of accelerating the plans of the New World Order. What they wanted was it to be in within the year 2000. It was funny actually that as the year 2000 clicked in, you remember K2, the bug, <laughs> and all the rest of it, yeah. and everybody was thinking this is it, this is it, and it, the click, it went ticked past midnight and nothing happened. It was all a farce, wasn't it? No. No. Well, it was in some ways, but not in others. It was designed to, to change every computer. It was. You're quite right. Oh, well. But in terms of us, in a sense, nothing happened. Things carried on as they were. The goal of the New World Order is to have a one world government. But I want to show you a few things of, of what's being said and what they're about. Now, this has come from uh, the Club of Rome and the Agenda 21 type website. And it says in this, in searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. All these dangers are caused by human intervention and therefore we get concerned by it. You do know it's a load of rubbish, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah we do. Exactly, good. See, I'm talking to the converted, aren't I, really? Yeah. <laughs> you probably know more than me, actually, to be fair. He's coming. Keep going, you don't know. Mikhail Gorbachev, yeah. The threat of the environmental crisis will be the international disaster key that will unlock, unlock the New World Order. Okay. I show you these because these are things that are not just, you know, you can't say, well, it's all in your mind. These are things that people have said. You know who Mikhail Gorbachev is. A total population of 250 to 300 million people. A 95% decline from present levels would be ideal. One of their aims is mass extermination. Look at that. Ted Turner also said, people who abhor the China one-child policy are dum-dums.
I suppose in some ways this may be a true statement that current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake the use of fossil fuels, electrical appliances, home and workplace, air conditioning and suburban houses are not sustainable. Well, perhaps that's right. But you can see where things are heading. The UN's Agenda 21 outlines the globalist plan for a completely managed global society, all under the auspices of the UN. The United Nations is taking a real big lead in this. Why? Because the people at the top and the people involved are all part of this sort of Illuminati type regime. But look at that though, a total managed global society. Effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. A major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals and an unprecedented redeployment. In other words, taking people and putting them where they want them to be. Mm. Why? Because you can control them. Yeah. You know, if you live... A place like Wales is wonderful, isn't it? You've got loads of uh, places where you can live remotely, out of the way. Probably no one will even know you were there. They can't control you there, can they? But if they make those places out of bounds and move you into the cities, so much easier. You'll be on camera and everything else. Human and financial resources. This shift will demand that a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action be integrated into individual and collective decision making at every level. You know, it's almost like you've got to be careful about your environment and the consequences of everything you do before you do it. Well, perhaps that's not a bad thing in some ways, but it's the control that's going with it as well. I thought this was quite interesting. Under the new system that's to come, private property will be eliminated, as will personal vehicle ownership. I have to ask myself the question, why would you do that? Because of control. If you have not got your own car, you can't go where you want. If you've got your own house, you dictate what you do to that house. But if you haven't, and you live in a, a rented accommodation or something like that, or something that's given to you, you can't do anything except what is wanted by those who let it, you have it. People, this is again Agenda 21, people will be herded like cattle into cities, while much of the land outside of these areas will be off limits to the public. These compact cities will be called habitat areas. Now this is all policy that's been made by the UN, Agenda 21, and all of these, these people within these different um, Club of Rome and, and such like. Herded into cities. Who's going to have the rest of the, pop you know, the, the areas that are left? Well, they'll be for the playboys, I'm sure. This is what Thomas Jefferson said, and it is... Um, it is quite enlightening, really, isn't it? I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. You look at that to start with and you think, how can that be? But if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around the banks will do until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. And that's exactly what's happening today, isn't it? We are controlled by inflation and deflation. Have you ever noticed when there's a round of pay talks and everyone gets a pay rise, have you noticed how something like inflation goes up? Yeah. Because with one hand they'll give it to you, with the other hand they take it back. It's all really about control. Just before I come on to this, you've all heard of Bitcoin, haven't you? Yeah. No. You haven't? No. You missed the news a couple of weeks ago then. But I'll come on to this in a second. First of all, I just want to say this. The governments that we have in place now, those that are dealing behind the scenes, used, use a sort of um, a thing that's known as the 
Piglelian dialect. I don't know whether I'll pronounce that right. But basically, it's a process of you have a problem, you have a reaction, you have a solution. But it's the governments that actually cause the problem or exploit the problem, yeah. <laughs> causing the people to react to the government and say, we need help with this, we want a solution. And then the government offers a solution which they had already planned for long before it happened. Okay, And that's the sort of thing that we are doing. And climate change is one of those things, really, where they made a problem. Climate change, j just like, you remember the ozone layer? You remember when the ozone layer was the big thing? Yeah. The ozone layer, was, this hole in the ozone layer is getting big. We're all going to die. The old, everything's going to be sucked out. And it became a big thing until someone went, hang on a minute, this is a natural phenomenon. The hole opens and closes. But of course, we're in a similar situation now with uh, global warming. They did a study that told us that the Earth was heating up. But they left lots of stuff out that showed actually this is just the way the Earth is. You know, temperatures will rise, temperatures will fall. But the fact is, they made it a problem so that the people would react and say, hey, we don't want to be flooded. We don't want this. And so they implemented a control procedure by making us do certain things. Yeah. You know, Even silly little things like getting rid of your light bulbs. You can't have the old light bulb anymore. You must have the new one. You know, <laughs> it goes a little bit far, really, but that's what they do. <coughs> the other question, of course, is this financial collapse that's come in because of the situation that's been made what makes that any different from the 1930s? Because the 1930s was also brought about by an e economic boom. It was at the time when Ford motor cars had started their productions and stuff like that. Everybody wanted a car. So loans were made available to everyone. And so we had, you know, the boom and the, that was going on, the economic boom. We also saw even then, because of those things, that there was buying on credit. Now, you know that over the last few years, the banks have been zapping everything at you to get on credit. Why? Because once you're on credit, you're under their control. Mm -hmm. My son, uh, when he was 18, he did the terrible thing. He split up with his girlfriend. That wasn't the terrible thing. The terrible thing was that because the banks were throwing money at him, he went on a £20,000 spending spree. Oh, All right? that's what I did. Yeah? And I only found out about it when little notes from the debt collectors were coming in. And I went to the bank and I said to them, we need to get out of this situation. Mm. And they said to me, um, are you going to want to borrow any more money? I said, well, I am because I need to redo the debt and, and everything. No, we won't do that. And I called the woman immoral at the time, mm. you know, because she'd got my, well, you know what I mean. Mm. They did it so that my son got into debt, but they weren't prepared to help me out. Mm. No, why? Because they got him mm. where he want, you know. I ended up having to put 20 grand on my mortgage in order to sort of to, to do that. The stock market in those days was booming. It was going up to record levels, just as it does today. But there was a sort of a recession on, you know, on the horizon. And all of a sudden, things just went boom. We're at the same sort of stage now. Yeah. But the difference is that in those days... Money was linked to what was known as the gold standard. And people only sort of really had the money that they had. Printing money was not what we would call an option back then. Or certainly not in the way it is today. But you see, now today, they, they look at quantitative easing. And uh, the way I understand quantitative easing is that uh, the Bank of England print more money. And in order to keep inflation from going up or whatever it is they want to stop, they then throw a certain amount of cash into the economy. And it eases the problem. So they call it quantitative easing. That's my understanding of it. Very, very sort of soon. And of course the banks, which Thomas and Jefferson said about, are now controlling the situation. They are controlling the amount of money being put in. But the problem is they've got themselves into such a problem that they can't stop printing money. Because the moment they stop printing money, things will start to go yeah, boil over again. So they have to print more. And they go, and they print more. And do you know what I'm saying? So we're in this spiral that actually we cannot get out of. We cannot get out of it. I don't know whether you noticed on the front 
screen when we were, were waiting to come on. There was a thing that said HSBC. Yeah. Do you remember in the news um, a few months ago now, uh, there were people reported going into the money to take out a few thousand pounds. And they were told they couldn't because they hadn't got a legitimate reason for taking out that amount of money. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I thought, wow, control. Yeah. And, and the, what was behind that was the fact that they were worried of having a run on the banks. Mm -hmm. And people were going and just saying, well, I'm going to take 5,000 out. Why do you want to take 5,000 out? Well, I've got no reason. I'm just going to take 5,000. Well, in that case, you can't. If you can't, and they had to bring proof of what they were going to spend their money on. And that suddenly got leaked to the press. And, of course, it then got crushed. Oh, no, no, that was, that, that was some overzealous staff. <laughs> well, I think overzealous staff are what we call testing the market, aren't they? To see what reaction we would get. Have the problem, or a creative problem, see what the reaction is, and then we'll get, we'll get things in place what we want in place. That's the way it's going to be. The second thing that makes things um, different to the 1930s, of course, now... It's globalisation. We don't operate as a single country anymore. We cannot shut our borders to the things that are going on anymore. And so globalisation plays such a big part. When you go into your supermarket, you will find that your vegetables come from every area of the world. Yeah. You know, your tomatoes will come from Spain, your peppers may come from Israel, as I found out the other day, which meant I bought them. <laughs> uh, you know, your butter comes from Australia and places. It comes from everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Now, what happens if all of a sudden we have a collapse? All of a sudden, the people that fly it from A to B can't fly it from A to B. The roads, you know, we can't. The trucks won't be able to afford the diesel to get it from B to C. We suddenly find ourselves in a predicament. And you know what it's like if you, up, if you hold up the last loaf of bread. You only have to mention, don't you, the fact that there may be a shortage of something and a guarantee that the shop down the road will be empty of it before you can get out of bed. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the way we are. And so you can see what it talks about in, in Scripture there coming to fulfilment very easily, that there will be scarcity of food. And the things that we take for granted will cost... A day's wages. Yes. It's incredible, isn't it? We are so dependent on other countries. Everyone has gone from only spending what you knew you had to spend in order to sort of balance your books at the end of each, each week or month. And now, well, you can borrow anything up to about ten times your house's worth and... Uh, it's become the norm, isn't it? Mm. You know, to see people that have got a mortgage of anything upwards from £500,000 is normal these days. Mm. None of this has happened by <coughs> accident. It has been, behind the scenes, I believe, to be cleverly orchestrated in order to bring about what will be a new world order. I was looking at, um, you know last year they, uh, the government said that they were going to tighten up the banking system. And so they brought in the Financial Services Banking Reform Act in 2013. It's interesting to see, if you read through there, you will see certain things in there that you would not know. And if there is new stuff in there that basically says that within the main area of banking which is lending money and taking money. That's the main area of banking, isn't it? They can actually, at any time they like, and for a reason, although it doesn't stipulate what that reason might be, they can stop your bank account. They can stop your bank account. So it almost now, within legislation, there is the cut-off switch. Do you remember it, it happened in uh, Cyprus, didn't it? Uh, uh, yeah. a couple of yeah. years ago they, they basically stopped everybody having their money yeah. Right. Yeah. and then they said right you can only have a certain amount of money every week out of your bank and it didn't matter whether you were a millionaire or nothing mm. you only had the same amount of money yeah. Yeah. and within the, within the airports at that time as well where people were taking money to go on holiday if you had more than that amount of money it was taken off of you yeah. that's how it got 
we now have the conditions in this country with the legislation to do exactly the same. And I think you will find that if you go anywhere in Europe under the European market, that those conditions apply everywhere. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if it's not a worldwide thing. Mm -hmm. So, we've heard in the news recently about the, the collapse of the dollar. We've heard that if the dollar collapses, then the rest of the markets will go with it. Almost like a deck of cards. But there is, I believe, something else going on, uh, un sort of under the surface. But it's starting to come above the surface now, and that is a new system, and that's this Bitcoin. Bitcoin was actually thought up by Thomas and Jefferson a long time ago as a different means to the banking system. The problem was um, that no one wanted it and it didn't catch on. As I say, you may not have heard of Bitcoin, but it, it popped up in the news a, a few weeks ago when, I believe, somewhere in Europe, uh, a bank, I think it might have been even Italy, uh, a bank had some Bitcoin stolen. Do you remember that? Did you see that on the news? Okay. Well, I thought for myself then, that is just testing the waters. Oops, is that? Hang on. Let me just sort of um, go through what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is a digital monetary system, a virtual gold standard with no borders, no country. Now, the word digital and virtual should make you realise oh, yeah. that that is very controlled by a computer system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And virtual means, well, it's not really there. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Virtual reality. Virtual, yeah. So it's a brand new system, but it's a system that's getting very popular. It doesn't have any borders or countries, so therefore it would be very hard to put any sort of legislation to it. Unless, of course, that legislation was from a one-world type government. So, most currencies at the moment are falling. Don't worry about the, um, the percentages and that. That was when I put it on some time ago. Um, but all the different currencies are falling. The dollar is falling. The pound is falling. Every, but Bitcoin is actually going up. Now, why would that be? It would be because they want people to get to know Bitcoin and to start using Bitcoin, which is something that they are now doing. MasterCard, now you would have thought MasterCard, well, why would they come on board? I mean, they've got the place wrapped up already, haven't they? But they say desperate times call for desperate measures. In other words, perhaps it is time for a new system to come along. The Bitcoin is powered by eight times stronger computers than the top 500 computers combined within the world today, which means it's working on something that is humongous. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the other thing about it is that this computer system is not really connected to any of the banks. And yet, you can transfer your money to Bitcoin, and Bitcoin at the moment back to money. But of course, as it's virtual and everything, there may be a time when that stops, and you can only have Bitcoin if you think ahead. So it's, 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 it's an up-and-coming system. It's now being used quite a lot. Especially America has took this up quite, quite amazingly. Walmart, well, they're over here now, aren't they, as well? Yeah. Um, I can't remember who CBS are now, you might know. But Nike and other banks um, are all starting to use it. And in fact, the last time I looked, 35 out of the 50 American states now pay a lot of their workers in Bitcoin rather than dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, if your own country is turning from your own currency, you've got to ask the question, why? Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's losing faith in dollar. Bit like stamps. Sorry? Bit like stamps. Yeah, bit like stamps. PayPal, which processes 60% of all web transactions, is updating its stuff to be able to use Bitcoin. So that you'll have that option. It's going to eventually be integrated into everybody's web browser so you can use it everywhere. Skype, Twitter, Google... All of these things, they're all coming on board and looking at Bitcoin and going, yeah, we like this. This is good. Look at that. We send over 107 trillion emails every year. 
you will soon be able to use and transfer Bitcoin through email. Can you imagine how that's going to work? I, I can't really, but anyway, the, th the fact is, it is a, it's a currency that is starting to go global. Your cell phone. Now, my wife has a cell phone that she does just about everything on. She can do a banking on it. She can talk to friends. She does her Facebook. She does everything on it. The trouble is, if she loses her phone, that's <coughs> right. end of. So I'm the old, I'm the old store yeah, who I'm uses a phone for what it's supposed to be for. <laughs> uh, using it for phone calls and the odd text message, and that's about it. Uh, the only good thing about it is I have got a calendar that I use like as, uh, for my meetings and that on it, and that's quite helpful. <laughs> or storing people's addresses so I know where I'm coming. <laughs> but apart from that, I won't touch it with anything to do with financial stuff. But you can see the amount of money at stake, even in dollars, with phones and, and all sorts going on. China. Now, you wouldn't have thought China, would you? No. But China is you, uh, uses it to buy certain things, such as coffee, medical equipment, wine. But look at the other countries that are already using it as well. Yeah. You know, it's, it's going. Yeah. Now, when I, when I put this up, one Bitcoin was worth about £750. That may well have changed. But the fact is, it was being marketed as, as if you've got Bitcoin, Bitcoin, you've got, or Bitcoin, you've got freedom. Because you've got money. But we go back to that thing again where we've had a creative problem, a financial crisis, and, pe and the banks have played a big part in that. You know, we don't trust the banks anymore, government. You've got to do something about this. We've got a big problem. And so the solution appears to me to be Bitcoin. Now, I may be totally wrong about this. I've put my hands up. But the way that you see things rolling out um, makes me believe that this is where it's going. Look at the good points. Bitcoin, apparently, is totally secure. And the reason it's secure is because, one, it's, it's a digital thing. It's virtual. It has no center, no bank to attack. You know, so you can't hack into it in the same way that uh, you can perhaps a bank or you can't scam somebody uh, in the same way. And it uses this thing called quantum cryptology. Now, I haven't got a clue what that means, but I do know that it is quite secretive. It's the sort of things that people at <coughs> the FBI and that use to make sure that their stuff is not hacked into. And they will claim at the moment, anyway, that there can be no fraud. The reason there can be no fraud is because it's digital, and therefore every Bitcoin has a digital footprint. Okay, So when you purchase Bitcoin, if you like, the Bitcoin comes under your name. Okay, So let's say I've got 500 Bitcoin, and my, my Bitcoin sort of thing says it's SL something, so it's Steve Lloyd something. Okay, that goes wherever it goes. So if I give my Bitcoin to one of you, there is a digital sort of uh, paper chase. So I can tell where it's come from, yeah? So if you were to go to a bank or somebody else and you nick your Bitcoin from them, what's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to trace it, aren't they? Yeah, because it's now with you. Like the chip. So you can't nick it. It's quite ingenious, really, when you think about it. And at the moment, anyway, because legislation hasn't caught up with it, it's outside the tax system. So it's a great loophole for not paying your taxes. It, it looks good. But then again, all the things that we don't want bought in always look good, don't they? Yeah. Let me just take it a step further. You're dealing with numbers, and actually when you open a Bitcoin account, you become a number. You find that quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Your Bitcoin has its own digital number. You have your own number. No so you're no longer a person. That's exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you have lost your personality, if you like. Yeah. And I found that quite an interesting uh, piece of information. <coughs> you know, for the first time, we're looking at when the Bible says, and the number of his name, 666. Yeah. Is that when, what we're now getting used to being, a number? I know the Bible goes on to tell us where that number will be. Um, but it's an interesting fact, though, isn't it? An interesting fact. Yeah. I'll leave you to mull that one over. Now, put that with things such as RFID, radio frequency identification, which is coming in. Okay. It came in with a perceived threat of terrorism. You know, when 9-11 occurred, and don't get me on 9-11... <laughs> but when 9-11 occurred, everybody said, we've got a problem here with terrorism. 
And so the people cried out for a solution. We want to be protected. We want to be protected. And so the government provided their already planned solution, which was to go into the Middle East and, and blow it to bits, basically, wasn't it? And, and, and do the rest of the things they want. In a sense, with RFID, uh, these radio frequency identification things, which are in just about everything these days, um, I'm, I know that they're in tyres, yeah. got little chips in tyres, even within some of your clothing. I think Levi Jeans is one that has it. Yeah. In a sense, what it, what, it, yeah, what it does is when everything's available, and I'm not saying it is at the moment, but when it is, they will be able to track everything there is about you. They will know where you've been, and they will know what you've been up to. It's interesting. And when you put those two things together, you come up with a possibility of this. That the mark of the beast is already here. Now you'll hear so many things about, I mean I, I've, I've been listening to things about changing DNA that would bring in that sort of mark, but they leave out the bit about the head and the fore, fore you know, the, the, your hand. So whether it's that or not, I don't know. But this to me seems quite a way of controlling people and the agenda of the New World Order is, is bringing that to, together. And so in a sense, the, the need has never been more urgent, has it? No. This situation, uh, and, I, and I'm told by different sources that this crash that will occur is supposed to happen sometime this year. Now, I've, I've seen videos of people within uh, the Agenda 21 and other things who have given a date that has just passed. So things are well on the way. Mm -hmm. But I have heard others say, well, it will definitely be this year. Now, I don't know, you know, because only God knows the future. That's right. But it's certainly, it, it's certainly time mm -hmm. that you... I'm not telling you to get rid of all your money, but what I am saying is, <laughs> mentally, don't hold on to it. That's right. All right? Look, to Look to the Lord in, in terms of yeah. who's going to keep you, because there may come a day... If this comes in before the rapture, that we may find ourselves suddenly without anything. Yeah. And who do we look to then? We need to look to Christ yeah, and look to the Lord. Exactly. I don't want you to take anything that I've said here as what I call the gospel truth. I, I would say to you, go and look for these yeah. things for yourselves. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a sensationalist by being a copper. Or, you know, I'm quite feet on the ground type thing. I'm quite a sceptic. But when you put all these things together, and with everything else that's happening in the world at the moment, you can't help but think the time is at hand. Mm -hmm. The time is at hand. And there is only one way to be totally safe and secure, and that is in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. What is being brought about is of uh, an ungodly nature. But of course, Christ is of God and is the Son of God and is God. And he has provided a way for us. Now I'm sure that every one of you here this morning knows Christ. Because you're here. Uh, but there may be a chance that there is someone here that's not. And so I'd say to you at this moment in time is take, take what I've said and look into it. But Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the one who died upon the cross for each one of us. And he is the one who can keep our souls safe. And who says to us, Store up treasure in heaven, yeah. not on earth. Yeah. And I don't say that because I've got no money to store. Yeah. <laughs> um, I say that out of a genuine concern. Yeah. Uh, there, we have uh, African students in our church at the moment, and one of them who was leading worship just the other day, and I end with this, had said to his wife, are you ready to leave all this behind to be with the Lord? And you know, it made her think for a little while, and she said to start with, well, I'm not sure because I've got family. I don't want to leave my family. And uh, my little baby's only sort of two years old and I don't want to leave him. Now, they're, they're what you call genuine concerns. But it does make you think about the things we do hang on to. You know, the God who loves us and will take care of us knows who we are and what we are. But he does say, follow me. He does say, follow me. Shall we pray? Yeah. Father, we just thank you for opening our eyes to what's going on around us. Because, Father, your word says when you see these things happen, 
look up for your salvation is near. And Lord, we know that you have saved us. We know that you've placed your spirit within us. And your spirit says to us, the time is close. And so, Father, I just ask that we would honour you with every part of our lives. That we would want to walk with you and not with the world. Father, keep us in many ways separate from worldly things. So that we don't hang on to things, but we hang on to you. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. This uh, message, in a sense, is a bit different to what we had earlier on. Uh, I've titled it No Surrender because, really, this is a challenge to you and to me and uh, that we don't surrender our faith uh, to the things around us. I'm going to read in a moment from Daniel chapter 3, so if you want to get that ready, you uh, now's the time to do it. As you know, the book of Daniel is a very prophetic book. And uh, it's probably the most quoted book on prophecy outside of Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation. It's the one we go to, isn't it? And, uh, but contained within its pages is, in fact, an amazing challenge, I believe, to us as Christians in these last days. There is, as we've said this morning, so much power, uh, so much power, so much happening in the world uh, Power is passing from one nation to another. We are seeing the decline of America in its world power status, and that seems to be transferring its time over towards Russia and China, certainly uh, in terms of military strength and, and e even economically. We're seeing uh, things happening now in the Middle East. Uh, even Saudi Arabia was showing off the missiles that it's got, which is going to nucleify, if you like, uh, later on, if Iran carries on the way it's going, it doesn't want to be left out there, and it wants a means of its own protection. Iran, despite what it seems to be saying to the world, is continuing with its nuclear program. So there's a lot going on out there at the moment. Nearer to home, of course, our government is giving in to Sharia law and allowing that to have a foothold in our country. We actually have almost a two-tier law system at the moment, one for you and one for the Muslim community. And in any nation, that should not be the case. But it is. And so the question is, where does that leave us as Christians in this changing world and in the things that are happening? We're going to look at uh, Daniel 3. That's the best picture I could get of a golden image. Um, and I just really want to, to read a few verses from, from there. Uh, start at verse 1. Uh, I want to, to read from there. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors and the councillors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the councillors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. I'll leave it just there. Nebuchadnezzar made an image, a golden image, the dimensions of which you have in your scriptures, clearly referring with the number six to something that is worldly and satanic. But before we go any further with that, if you go back a chapter, uh, you come to um, the king having a dream about a different image. An image made up of different metals. And he was given uh, the interpretation to it. 
To cut the sh story short, Daniel interprets for the king and tells him about the different parts of the statue and what's going to happen. Different empires, with his being the greatest. He was that head of gold. And then you go through and it comes down to the toes of iron and clay that was to come. So he's the first empire and he sees what is, in a sense, the last empire. And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 45, we read, For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation of it therefore, or thereof, sure. Nebuchadnezzar had been shown a wonderful picture of history and the coming of the Messiah. So what does he do? In chapter 3, we read that actually, instead of looking at what he had been given in his dream of that thing, he makes up something which is clearly uh, what I would call anti-Christ. The sixes are there that show us that. It's something of man. It is a statue of a system that is yet to come. It's a statue all of gold. You see, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't want his empire to end. He wants it to be all gold. But it's a man's system. It's a man's empire and not God's. I suppose if we were in his position, we would be at the same thing, wouldn't we? We would say, no, it's all mine. I don't want it to end. And so he sets up in the plain of Jura this amazing image and basically says, right, when, it, when all the music plays, you're all going to bow down. And if you notice, all of the type of council officials of all ranks are invited to be there. Do we not see a similar thing today where all the council officials are up and down from government level right the way down are all bowing to the tune? We'll look at those tune and the tune and that in a moment. And everybody, it says, the nations, the languages and all the rest, everyone, when they hear the tune, is to bow down. It's not the game of musical chairs that we've all come to like, of course, is it? But when the music plays, we are to bow down and worship this man-made Thing, this man-made system. And that's really what it says to us today. And the penalty for not doing so is death by burning. Burning in the furnace. Now you know, like every government, this king had his snitches. And he had his men that sort of <coughs> said, yeah, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are not doing what you're saying. When you play the music, O oh king, when you allow that music... They're not bowing down like everybody else. Well, you can imagine the king becoming incensed about that. And so he gets these three men before him. He's mad. Why aren't you bowing down to me? And uh, it's, it's quite interesting, really, that there they are with this fiery furnace in front of them. And uh, instead of saying, oh, sorry, king, you know, yeah, right, we'll do what you want. We'll bow down. We'll play the game. They actually turn around to him and say, in Daniel 3, verses 14 to 15, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said to, uh, unto them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do you, not, do you not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready that at the time to hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, and all the rest of it, he goes on to say, and worship me and fall down and worship the image that I've made, well, everything will be good. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? They're faced with this question. Well, you've got another chance. Do it or die. That's, that's the, that is it, isn't it? Do it or die. And their answer is not a chance. <laughs> 
Not a chance. No, God is faithful. Our God is indeed faithful. But there is a question here for us, isn't there? What would we do in that type of situation? Because in a similar sense, all right, it may not be a, a burning furnace, but we are in the stage now where if you mention Jesus at work, mm. you'll lose your job. That happened to uh, a girl the other day uh, in a nursery. She was asked by someone her thoughts about uh, gay marriage. And she told them what the Bible said. And she told them what she believed. Now, this was a conversation that was started by the other party. But that other party then snitched and went to the employer. You may have read about this. Yeah. And uh, said she started the conversation, and this is what she said, and she sang. So we see that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego here are relying on their God. But what they say is this. You know, we don't know whether God will save us or not. God will do what he wants. But one thing you do know is this, King. We're not going to bow down to your God. Yeah. We're not going to bow down to your idol. You see, we do have this way of thinking, people, and, I, and I'm not doing anybody down here, that we, we will come out with respect to the old cliches, well, God will look after us. Well, we know he will, but he may not do it the way we think he will. Okay, So it may mean that if we stand up and, and say something, that we might lose our job, and you'll go around and go, hang on, God, you said you'd look after me. Well, he is looking after us, but that doesn't mean you won't lose your job. So we must be ready to also face the con con uh, consequences of what we do, whether good or bad. You know, that is, is the way it is, isn't it? But Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego say, it doesn't matter what happens to us, we are not going to bow down to your idol. And so we get what's known, I think, as confession time. This is their confession. Their confession is, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. We will stand firm in worshipping our God. Amen. The God. And to which obviously Nebuchadnezzar goes, do you think your God's going to save you? Well, what a shock Nebuchadnezzar got. But it was all because they were told when the tune sounds, what are you going to do? And so we have a confession time, a confession time for us now, of the tunes of today. What are the tunes of today? <laughs> but before we get there, though, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was so incensed that actually he made that furnace <coughs> seven times hotter. So hot, in fact, that the soldiers that took them up to that furnace actually died of the heat. What a story of faith this is. That these three men are not only thrown into the furnace and rescued by God, but that they didn't even have the smell of smoke upon them. Amen. Now that is total salvation, isn't it? What a story. An amazing thing. But it's also a picture for us today of the situation that we live in ourselves. Now, some of us may live in some very dangerous situations, some of us not quite so. But we are all affected by the tunes of today. What are we expected to do when the music sounds? We are expected to go along with what this world tells us. The liar could be abortion. The harp could be homosexuality. The flute could be gay marriage. The cornet could be evolution. Because the music is made up of many instruments. They're all playing one tune, but there's lots of things going on. And those who will stand for the truth and stand for the gospel are going to be ridiculed and are going to be, as it were, thrown into the furnace. And so it's clear that we know what our confession will be. It's clear that we actually say to these uh, things that are going on, no surrender. No surrender. So what are these tunes? Well, everything from the word of God at this moment in time is being attacked. 
And you know, one of the sad things for me is that the church is involved in the attacking. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, Amen. Isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The church <laughs> is surrendering. When we see something that is clearly said in Scripture that we should not be doing, the church goes, well, we must move with the times. Yeah. Go with the flow, yes. So, I've, there may be more tunes than this. I've, I've just picked a few, really, that are what I call sort of headliners at the moment. First one is evolution. Have you noticed how evolution uh, has really come to the fore, especially now in our schools? Now, despite... Everybody, including scientists, saying we have no evidence for evolution. It's a theory that has been blown out of the water now. We're still teaching it to our children. And we're not te teaching it as a theory. We're still, or being told to teach it as a fact. Now, I don't know where you stand on creation, but my Bible tells me that God created the world in six days, and he put the writing in such a way that tells me that it was six literal 24-hour days. Now, I don't want to debate that with you all day, because it will take all day, I'm sure, for some. But the fact is, the church will turn around and go, well, it could have been, because it says a thousand years with God is a day, and a day is a thousand years, it could have been 6,000 years. Look at what it says. And it doesn't say that whatsoever. But the church, I mean, I know that the church in England minister of my own village, just, ha he doesn't really know where. He tries to mix the two together. He believes God created, but it took him a long time. <laughs> you know? And, yeah, it's a bit like that, isn't it? But the, fa the fact is that these people that are pushing this are pushing it very hard indeed. Because not only are they pushing evolution, but they are banning the alternative, which is creation. Mm -hmm. Now, everyone knows that in order to gain a bit of credence, if you like, you debate things, don't you? If you've got a point of view and I've got a different point of view, let's talk about it. But no, not at all. Creation is off the menu. And the church is allowing it to happen. They talk so often. I, I, I do get quite incensed when I watch programmes that talk about millions of years. Yeah. Millions of years. You know. But what can you say? <coughs> we know, for instance, that dinosaurs and man were together. It's quite easy to work out because the caveman painted the pictures on the walls. Yeah. For one thing. There are stories that abound. Even on your Welsh flag is a dragon. Yeah. Where did that come from? Because there are stories that go back that will tell you about those sort of things. And I say, we could go on about that all day. But the fact is this. Do we surrender creation to evolution? For a theory that's got nothing whatsoever to back it up. Do you know, I love the way that scripture puts what I'd call little throwaway comments in. Because within the first few chapters of, of Genesis, there is a little line of scripture that says uh, about God, um, and, he, and he sort of threw the stars in. I can't think of the wording of it now, it's gone out of my head. Flung, but flung into space. Flung into space, something like that. It's just, it's just almost like a little one-off comment. Oh, and, and, he, and he flung in the stars also. It's like just a little thing, you know? <laughs> Yeah, but... You know, when you take those words, as small as they may be, and you look at the word flung, what does the word flung? Flung means they come from here, and I think yeah, that way. Thanks. So they go that way. You see, the trouble is the scientists look at them billions of miles away over there and go, well, it took that long for the light to get here. Well, actually, the light started here first when you take it in Scripture and went that way. So we've always been able to see the light, yeah. except those in darkness, of course. But you know what I'm saying. Um, and so... What can we say? Do we surrender to it or do we support creation? Do we support what God says or do we allow the world to tell us what God is saying? It's got to be no surrender, hasn't it? It's got to be no surrender. What about secularism? There are those in our society that do not want God to be anywhere involved in our society. They want society to be, or, or our politics and everything, to be separate from religion. They don't want a state church. They want us to be separate. 
involved in that, of course, is the atheists and that, that are, are lobbying that, to get rid of the Bible everywhere. And, uh, and it's in the simple things. You know, when the council meet together and they open their meeting with prayer, they attack it. <laughs> That's bounced back a few times. But... You know, they don't want anything to do with the church within public life. You can be a Christian, but just don't bring it to work, is what they're telling us. You can't wear your cross. You can't say no to performing certain things just because you are a Christian. You notice that they would never say that to a Muslim. No. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you've got a and b you can't dictate who no. sleeps in your bed. Just recently, I had someone come up to me and say, isn't it good that David Cameron is saying we are a Christian country? Well, I suppose your words are nice, but look behind it and see what he's trying to do. He just wants your vote. That's all it is. He doesn't believe in us being a Christian country any more than Darwin believed in creation, if you see what I mean. Does he? But people say, oh, he's definitely one of us. Pray for him, by all means. We should pray for these people. But he doesn't believe in the God of the Bible. He doesn't want religion in, in work life any more than anybody else. It's just a vote grabber. I'm sure he would have an answer to that, but, but what about free speech? Am I not allowed to speak what my thoughts are? No. But I have to listen to everybody else. I'm sounding political here, aren't I? Yeah. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> I'm not political in any way, shape or form, me. But the fact is this, that there will be many Christians, I'm sure, that will get sucked in to that type of thinking. I'll vote Conservative because he said that we are a Christian country. Are we going to surrender the Gospel? For secularism? Do we care whether we can wear our crosses at work? I'm not personally myself, I'm not into crosses, but sometimes they are a good sort of discussion start, aren't they? Yeah. You know, people do want to hear about God. Let me just give you, if I may, one little thing that happened to me, um, I don't know, about two years ago now when I was in the police. I came on duty one morning to be told I was going to do a cell watch. Have I told you this? No, that's good. I do, I do have a habit of repeating myself. I do have a habit of repeating oh, myself. No. <laughs> I can't, and a cell watch is whereby you have to sit in the, in the door of the cell and watch a prisoner to make sure he don't harm himself. And the reason that you do that is because he's been brought in having harmed himself. Now, two or three days before, I had arrested a man for underage sex with a 13-year-old girl. And he'd been let out on bail. And in his defence, he was remorseful, and he decided to slit his wrists. So he was arrested for his own safety, and he was brought in while he was awaiting to go to court. And of course, this man in this cell was that man, the man that I'd arrested a couple of days earlier for that offence. <coughs> but normally, the people that are in these cells are asleep. So I grabbed my Christian book that I've got with me for such a time as this, because I thought, it's a chance to, to sit there, he'll be asleep, I'll read my book. Was he asleep? No. But he saw the book, and he saw that it was a book about God. And the first thing he said to me was, are you a Christian? And so I said, yes, and I ended up giving him my testimony. Hallelujah. And he wanted me to pray for him, which is amazing. And then afterwards, when it was my turn to be um, taken over by another person, he wanted the book as well. Oh. I've never seen that man again. But the fact is, he wanted to know, and God put me there, and it happened. And I do praise God for that. It's what I call a God moment. And I don't know where that bloke is now. I've never seen him again in my life. But I trust that that conversation started something off. But you see, if the secularism people had their way, you would not be able to do that. You would not be able to do that. I had my colleague tell me, after many conversations about Christ and his death upon the cross and his coming again, she turned to me one day she said, Steve, I'm worse off now, am I, than before I was told all of this. Yeah. And I had to say, yes, you are. <laughs> Until you believe in Christ as your saviour. And she says, I've got to do that, haven't I? And I said, yes, you have. She says, but I'm not ready. 
I'm not ready. And the, obviously the pull of boyfriend and all the rest of those things took her away. And we don't work, obviously we don't work together anymore. So, you know, I have to work, trust that God is working in her, in her life. And I, I desperately want her to come to know the Lord, but we don't know, do we? But if secularism uh, has its way, you won't be able to do that sort of thing. So should we give up? Or is it no surrender? Of course, no surrender. No deal. No deal. How will a godless society hear about God if we don't tell them? So, the gay agenda. Where does one start with the gay agenda? Say no more. Sorry? Yeah. Say no more. Gay marriage and homosexuality, in a sense, are together, aren't they? As a Christian, I love everybody. Amen. And I love a gay person no less than I would love any of you. If they come into my church, they will be welcome. Mm-hmm. But there is, of course, a stipulation that they have to be expected to hear what the Bible says yeah. about Amen. their situation. Amen. God clearly states in Leviticus 18.22 that you shall not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is an abomination. God doesn't use that terminology for very many things within Scripture, but he uses it for this. The same applies with same-sex marriage. In Genesis 2, 24 and 25, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they are both, na- uh, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and but were not ashamed. We are made for one another, male and female. The Bible is clear, and yet we see the church saying we must move with the times, and we must allow these things. We have a duty to love these people. But we have a duty to tell them about Christ and to tell them what God says. And God says, I do not change. Amen. I am the same yesterday, today and forever. Therefore, his word does not change. And we cannot make his word change. I was interested. Does anyone get the British Church newspaper? Because right. in issue 270, uh, which is a few weeks back now, uh, it, it said there that the Lord Justice Munby insists that Britain is no longer a theocracy and that the Bible must not be the guide of the courts. I would suggest it's not the guide of the courts, unfortunately, anymore anyway. But who is he to insist on such a thing? But you see, he's a person that would get taken notice of. Quite clearly, we are in the time what Jesus talked about as in the days of Lot. We have gone back fully to the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, now, I don't think that you can turn on a television programme where there is not uh, a gay person involved in it. If you're one of these that follows the soaps, uh, turn to them all and they're there. And they're in your face. Totally. On everything. My wife gets fed up with me going, ugh! Every time one comes on, I'm going to turn it off. But it's there, isn't it? You're not cleansing salt. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact is, do we, do we surrender the values that God has given us? And again, the answer's got to be no surrender, hasn't it? No surrender. Why do we allow these things to be the norm because that's what they're telling us now. It's, it's normal. And to be taught in our young schools, which is even more worrying because they're at that age where they will take it all in. Euthanasia is another big thing that's on the horizon at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. One of the latest tunes, as I would call it, is you can decide when you want to die. It's strange, really, isn't it? But as a police officer, um, my job was no one took the life of another. Because we used to call that murder. It's funny, though, isn't it? We call it murder. But 
under euthanasia, it's just murder in another form, isn't it? Yeah. Because in a sense, unless you're a clever person, I don't know quite how it works, someone else must have to minister the drugs in order to allow you to die. So whatever we call it, that person has just killed somebody else. And yet, the law is changing to say someone that does that will not be charged with murder. Everyone has the right to die when they want. They call it voluntary euthanasia. I was constantly coming up against going to places where someone had been involved in, I don't know, an accident or, or was ill or something like that. And I was being told constantly over the radio that this person has something in place called DNR, do not resuscitate. Yeah. Oh. And that is becoming more and more prevalent. People want that when they get to a particular time, if anything happens, do not resuscitate me. That goes against the grain for someone like myself who's going there to, to save people. But that's where we are. And of course, it won't be long, I believe, before euthanasia will be allowed in this country. It's only a matter of time. It's within Europe. And if we're within Europe, it's going to come here, isn't it? God is a God of life. A giver of life, not the taker of life. And we need to remember that as Christians as well. We saw earlier on that one of the plans of the New World Order, New World Order, is a mass culling of the population. Yeah. Yeah. For all we know, they could already have implemented that through the things that we give to our children by... Um, inoculating them against yeah. things. We don't know. Are those things causing problems that are causing the cancers and all the rest of it? Who knows? I've even read a, a, an account just recently of the fact that um, HIV was a man-made thing and they deliberately started it to go yeah. because they knew it would kill many people. Nothing. Thousands. Yeah. So we don't know, do we? But the fact is this. It's a tune that's playing at the moment. Do we stand for it? Do we allow people to die? Or do we stand up and say no? I think probably about once a week at the moment, I get through via the internet, someone wanting me to sign a petition on these issues. Get this before the, the government of the day. Stop it happening. But I have to wonder, does a petition really help? Do they take any notice? I'm not so sure that they do. This one, I suppose, should be one that really does concern you. If, I mean, they all do, but ecumenicalism. I have to slide it off the screen there. Chris Lamb, Rick Warren, is, is probably the, the latest tune that's being played, I would suggest. We are seeing a really big rise in ecumenicalism. Churches getting together with no basis of faith that they would agree on, mm -hmm. and yet coming together. We worship the same God, they'll say. Yeah. I mean, I've even heard Christians say, but surely Allah and God are the same. No, they're not. Yeah. They're not. Okay. Allah was the moon god of Mecca. That's yes. right. No more, no less. Amen. An idol and a figment of man's imagination. And yet, we see it rising to the fore, don't we? Mm. Yeah. And we see in the church coming together. Did you see, by any chance, if, you, if you're on YouTube, there was a, a German lady that went to a church in Germany that stood up against the fact that the church had brought in an imam to sing whatever it is they sing in the church. Oh. And basically, what that, what that was doing was cursing what was going on in the church. And she was the only one that stood up against it, and now she's getting death threats. Oh. You know, not from, I don't think from Christians, probably from, from Muslims perhaps, but the, the fact is that the rest of the church were quite happy for it to happen. How can the church get into bed with Islam? 
how can the, the Christian church and get in bed even with the Pope? Exactly. You know what I mean by getting to bed. I don't know. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, not literally. Not literally. But the fact is that we do not believe the same things. Yeah, that's right. It's flirting with them. Exactly. Yeah. Flirting is a good way of, of putting it, isn't it? But there are so many religions now that would say, well, all roads lead to the same place in the end. Utopia, it's heaven. We're all going to be gods anyway. If you've ever worked in uh, the sort of government uh, and public sectors, you will find uh, within uh, buildings now that they're opening these prayer rooms. I don't know if you've come across them. And uh, the prayer rooms are there for every faith. And I remember as the Christian Police Association in Bedfordshire being asked, would I support a prayer room? And I said, no. And they went, why not? I said, because that would mean me going into a room and sharing it with idols. Yeah. Yeah. Because that is what it is. But so many say, well, why not? We can all use it. It's all there, you know. No, I can't you, bring the you have to see the fact that you cannot, as a Christian, go along with these subtle things. No surrender. No surrender. You beat me to it. We're not quite there yet. No <laughs> The world would have us think that all these different religions have got their good points, but the fact is that all other religions, and, and I'm not being... I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but... You know, Christianity, Jesus, is the only true way to heaven. Amen. God is the only God. Mm. We cannot share with idols. And people like Rick Warren, who put together the Purpose Driven Life and the Purpose Driven Church, which I have to have my hands up and say, when the Purpose Driven Life came out, I looked at it, I thought, this is quite good. Not realising what was behind it at the time. And I actually went through it with our church. And I wish I hadn't now, and I've prayed for forgiveness for that. But, you know, I just didn't realise where that was going. And, of course, it was worded in such a way that things were, were made to look okay. But so much of the world was in it. And now this man is coming out and sharing the platform with Islam. Somebody once said that it was more scripture in that first book than in scripture. Well, <laughs> I also heard something recently where the, a lot of the charismatics are joining the Catholic, yeah. uh, people like Copeland and stuff like oh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. talking in strange tones, but yeah. you're actually uh, wrong. Yeah, very true, very true. And a lot of creepy stuff going on there. Like. Can I just tell you that uh, I was working in chaplaincy work in um, Neville Hall and the Gwent, and the chapel is now used as a prayer room for Muslims as well. Mm. Yeah. The Pope at the moment is making great inroads into joining the different religions together. Mm. Under himself, by chance, but yeah. that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to bring them all together. Ecumenicalism is a tune that the church leaders would like us to bow down to. The Archbishop of Canterbury has announced that members of the Roman Catholic, Catholic ecumenical community are to reside at Lambeth Palace. Uh, so quite clearly, we've gone right down the road with the Roman Catholics and the Church of England almost joining back together. You know, I mean, we, they come out of them. And uh, apparently it says that they share in a daily round of prayer that underpins the Archbishop's ministry and to further the ecumenical and international dimensions of his work. Interesting. I wonder what those dimensions are, apart from bringing the churches together uh, into idol worship. Ecumenicalism. Do we bow down to it? No, we don't. No surrender. No surrender. This one will get you going, I'm sure. Human genetics. Uh, some of you may have heard the, the lady at the front start to talk about DNA. It's very interesting yeah. what is going on behind mm -hmm. the scenes yeah. uh, on the DNA front at the moment. Now, I've put that goat up there because they've already produced silk 
from a goat by crossing the DNA of a silk spider and the goat, which is quite interesting. Uh, and it comes, it comes out somehow in the, in the goat's milk, but it's proper silk. And they can do it on larger scales. And I, I was interested to hear, as I was listening to something on the radio coming here, or on a CD, that in this country, we have already made 150 different hybrids involving human and animal DNA. Yeah, I did say human. Not just animal and animal, but human and animal. They have done so much with DNA that, um, you know, they've they're now got to the point of it being almost 50% human DNA, 50% of the animal. If you go back to the days of the Greek myths of God, gods and that, where you've got the half animal, half person, can you not understand where they might have gone? Yeah. Yeah. It's quite interesting. That, uh, that that's the way. They always start testing things on animals yeah. before they move up to humans. They are. And but they use them for, I've already heard of this, military reasons. Exactly. Using their eyesight, like cat's eyes, and cutting yeah. it into humans. And yeah. Their, their, their goal is to make, if you like at the moment, a super soldier. Yeah. A super soldier. One that will have total dominance on the battlefield. That will have immense strength that they will get from one that will have, as you say, quite clearly, eyesight that will be able to see almost like infrared or whatever. Yeah. You know? It's some amazing things is what they... But, of course, what they start off by doing is saying, this is for medicine's sake, and we can prevent things from... Ha we can prevent cancers, we can prevent uh, dementia, we can prevent all of these things through touching up your DNA. And you look at that and you think, wow, that's got to be good. And it, in some ways it is, isn't it? But man's mind is evil. Man's heart is evil, and he uses it for evil things. We've just had, haven't we, the um, first embryo made using three donors instead of two. Where's that going to go? Who's going to be its real parents? But things are going on in great steps. I want to just bring your attention to... Uh, Matthew 24, verse 37, where Jesus says, As it was in the days of Noah, yeah. so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Yeah. Now, we look at that usually by taking the next verse where Jesus says, well, there'll be wars and there'll yeah. be all this going on. But actually, if you go back to Genesis 6, verse 4, we actually get a bit more of the picture of what was going on in those days. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, and they were the heroes of old men of renown. Mm. Now, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but it seems to be that back in the days of Genesis, that the fallen angels created children with human women. That's what it seems to be. And the result was the Nephilim, these, these giant-type creatures. Yeah. A mixing of DNA. And I believe, and I can't be said this, but I believe if you go back, you, you actually get, in the true meaning of the word, it, it does almost bring it back to the DNA. Mm. Yeah. Where did the giant come from that was with David? Well, the, well yeah, but the thing David. was, now there is a bit that I, I don't understand, and I'll be perfectly honest, and I don't want to get into the debate of it at the moment, because it says, and afterwards, mm -hmm. the flood yeah. wiped out everyone but Noah and his, yeah. and his family. So where did they come from, yeah. except that the fallen angels were still there? Yeah. And they've done it again, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, the, the fact is this. When it talks about Noah being, if you like, a righteous man, if you go again back to the original, actually what it's saying is that he was still a pure person and his family was still... They hadn't been got at by these fallen demons. And therefore God saved them in the ark when he, he got rid of the rest. Now that's what I understand and I'm, I'm open to criticism on that, but we, we won't go into that at the moment if you don't mind. But Jesus talked about in the days of Noah these things would occur. And that's what is going on right now. <coughs> in science laboratories all around the world, millions and millions of pounds and dollars and all the rest of it is being put into this type of work. The fiddling of the DNA. That's the best way of putting it, I suppose, isn't it? You know, they are, and 
we were mentioning earlier that there is this um, antichrist sort of part of, of DNA. And uh, what was interesting to me actually was on the way here that I was reading that, of course, we are the, as, as we are made in the image of God, but we, we also have had or are called the temple of God. Now, God tabernacled with us when he was with Moses. Yeah. And, the, and, and the tabernacle apparently was made up of 46 different panels, apparently, around the side. I haven't, I haven't checked this out yet. But within our brain or something, there is 46 bits as well, and it ties in quite well. And what they're trying to do is that these 46 bits, because we always know that things in Scripture relate to you know, spiritual things, they're rehearsals or, or things to get things over to us. And I would encourage you to look at this. But the idea is they're trying to tamper with these bits and put in their bits of the DNA. Mm. And what that would actually do is no longer make that person in the image of God or a soul that could be saved. And now, taken away from the fact that the Bible clearly says on the forehead or on the, on the hand that about the mark of the beast, this could be a way of what he was trying to do back in, uh, in Genesis of getting us away from God yeah. by taking away the DNA and making us different people. I don't know. It's in it, to me, this is infancy stuff, but it's been going on for some time. See if I can share later, if, if you want me to, about the DNA, what I mean. Okay, yeah. If, if you would at the end, that would be good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are now at a point where we are in the days of Lot and we are in the days of Noah. Now, if that's the way it seems to be, then the Lord's coming is not far away. Yeah. But the point is this. Do we surrender to this? Do we allow uh, these things to no. if you like, infiltrate our minds and, and go the way that they would have us go? No. And the answer's got to be no. If we disciple them, why should we? Exactly. The Nephilim was the result of these fallen creatures and women. Women of the earth. You could say, like Goliath, they are these super soldiers. Yeah. This is what man wants to be. But the point is this. We are called not to surrender. The point is that with all these tunes being played, if we go back to Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego, we are fast approaching the furnace scenario where the choice has to be made. Do we bow down, or do we make a good confession? <laughs> that good confession is that we take no regard for ourselves, but we trust that we will do what is right with God. We don't know what God will allow to happen to us. I remember being, if you like, opened up to the fact that I was coming home from work one day on my motorbike, having had a bad day in the police, thinking, I'm scared. I'm scared on the street of what might happen to me. Because there was a lot of stuff going on. And all of a sudden, it flooded into my mind that God is my fortress, my rock, my strong tower, my protector, my, the hedge. He's all of these things. What have I got to be scared of? And that made such a difference to my life. And I also realised that whatever comes into my life, has been allowed by God for my good. And therefore, if something, if you like, bad comes in, or something I consider to be bad, God's allowed that in the first place. Therefore, I need to give him praise. And secondly, it will turn out for my good. And therefore, again, I must give him praise. But God says to me, and I believe he says to each of us, we are not to bow down. We are not to surrender. There are many, I'm afraid, that have started the walk, but have given in. And where are they now? There are many in our churches that would say, none of this is a problem for me. And if someone wanted to change my DNA and make me a superman, I'll go for it. I'm sure there are those there that would take it without realising what they are doing. Daily in the world we hear of Christian men and women who are being given a choice to repent or die. Many in Muslim countries, but we see it in Syria, we're seeing things happening in Nigeria, in Pakistan, and other countries around the world, where people are saying, renounce your faith 
or die. It is coming here, I believe. It is. It is coming here. People wouldn't agree with that. They'd say, no, it could never. You know how, how easy it is to wander into something that you think will not happen. So what about us? It is a big call to say like Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego said. But if we deny him, if we deny Christ, the Bible tells us that he will deny us. If we have not yet come face to face with death for our faith, well that day is only time away, isn't it? But we are daily being called to not surrender. And I trust that what I've put before you is something for prayer, but also a challenge. And uh, I trust that you will be found like Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego, saying it doesn't matter what happens to me, I am going to follow God. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that you have given us everything that we need in Christ. You have given us of your Holy Spirit so that we can say no surrender. But Father, we are human and we know that we will get scared in the face of many things. But Father, when that day comes and as we are faced with these decisions, Lord, help us to rely on you and say no surrender. To keep our faith and not deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, Father, we know that we have so much more waiting for us than what we have down here. There is nothing down here worth keeping or hanging on to. But, Father, in heaven where you are is all that we need. So, Father, as we go into the world and we are part of that world, keep us separate from it. (coughs) Keep us close to you. In Jesus' name we ask.